This is the Forbes Books Podcast, conversations with remarkable folks who are impacting the world of business and beyond. Hola, I'm Joe Partavilla, and for much of my adult life, people have said, I have a face for radio, and maybe they're right, and possibly my guest this week can give me a hand. His name is Dr. Dennis Schimpf. As the founder of the esteemed Sweetgrass Plastic Surgery, he and his team perform thousands of reconstructive and cosmetic procedures each year, helping patients restore confidence and transform their lives. Dr. Schimpf is also an accomplished author and speaker. He wrote the acclaimed book, Finding Beauty, Become a Better You Through Plastic Surgery, sharing the wisdom and insights on using plastic surgery to reveal one's inner beauty. Doc, how are you today? Good, Joe. How are you doing today? Pretty fantastic. And so I want to start this conversation by talking about your sort of journey through medicine, because I always find it fascinating, because there's so many fields of medicine, how you find yourself into one thing. So plastics. I know it, the the famous line in uh, in the graduate was the future you know the future's plastic, but why plastic surgery? How how did you end up in in that space? Well, I really came to medicine through a non traditional route. I was about four months away from graduating from college. I was going to go to uh, law school actually and and do a graduate degree. And because I had neglected to do my community service that I needed to volunteer hours, uh, I had like a couple hundred hours I had to do uh, in the program I was in to graduate. And my counselor was like, the only way you're going to get that done before May, and of course this was like January, is to go somewhere that's open 24 hours a day. And so I ended up going to a local small emergency room, started volunteering in there, just you know cleaning up, pushing patients around, kind of just hanging out. And I loved it. You know, I, I absolutely loved it. And I did, you know, that for those couple months. And at the end of it, I, I just decided I, I was going to try to go to medical school. And I, I had never gone and done any of the sciences. So I had to spend the next year and a half taking one semester. I remember I took uh, chemistry, anatomy, physics, and something else. And it was just, you know, hard, but I did the best I'd ever done in school. And so, uh, you know, I spent that year and a half and ended up doing a little bit of graduate work in neuroscience while I was doing it. And, uh, ended up in medical school. And then I knew I wanted to do something like hands-on and uh, surgery was just something I always was kind of fascinated with. But originally I thought I was going to do neurosurgery, but um, ended up going the general surgery route. And at the end of general surgery, you either go practice general or you specialize. And I loved plastic surgery because it was the the one specialty that you still operate on the whole body and uh, wasn't really tied to one area. So you know, plastic surgery includes cancer reconstruction, uh, you know, surgery on children, cleft lip and palates, burns, uh, microsurgery. And then, of course, the thing everyone knows is aesthetics and cosmetic. But it's really a small part of the overall training. I did five years of general surgery, then two years of plastic surgery fellowship and uh, been in practice now, I don't know, about 15 years or so. There's not many doctors I speak to who, who say they became doctors because they partied too much in college. Was that essentially why you were just, you were having such a good time that you forgot about all the other things you needed to do? Is it, is it, is, I mean, is, was that, I mean, it's like the sliding doors thing. Like if you concentrated in school, Dennis, who knows what you did, we would have done. Joe, I'm not sure that's exactly what I said, but that may have been the message. Uh, you know, I, I went to school on an a athletic scholarship. I, I definitely was not uh, school focused the whole time. And uh, I was very fortunate to, to go the path that I went and uh, actually went back to school you know, after graduating to do a graduate or a MBA degree. So I, I got better with schooling as I went along. I, I realized the importance of it more as time went on. <laughs> That's good. And you know what's funny? Uh, so you and I are probably old enough to sort of recognize this sort of societal feeling towards plastic surgery. Because when I was a kid, you know, we're, we're, I guess we're around the same age, maybe Gen Xers. But when we were younger, it was sort of like, oh, look at the work they got done. And now it's like, oh. Look at the work they got done. So it's funny how that the in terms of just it's not even just like the actual. Sur I'm sure I'm sure I'm sure the surgery has evolved since you started and such. But like the attitudes towards it have evolved, where it's not so much like the what I was taught, like that sort of like tone of like, oh my god, look what they've done. Did you when did you start to realize that this was sort of becoming more and more acceptable and not just being like a rich person thing to do? Right. I think a couple things have happened. You know, not only that. Um, I think the patients themselves had become more comfortable with it and more almost proud of having some of it done. And I think the effect it's having on them, feeling more confident, they're wearing you know different clothing, different bathing suits. So I, I think that progression has come with, 
social media and the media in general, I think, uh, you know, I hate to say it, but things like the Kardashians have brought to the forefront different types of cosmetic surgery. I think Hollywood and that whole world has probably evolved from, like you said, it was hush hush and nobody wanted you to know to it's okay and it's okay to do something. And I always find it interesting because almost in every other facet of our life, we'll try to do things to better our situation. You know, you go out and try to get nice clothes, you try to get a nice haircut, women try to get nice makeup, they're getting their hair done, their nails done out in the open without a problem. You know, nobody goes into the store and says, give me the ugliest clothes that you have and I want to look bad. Uh, to the, even the house, you know, that you live in, you decorate it to look nice, you buy a car that you like. I just, it's kind of weird that then with the most personal thing where we had to be shy about it or not seem like it mattered. And I think it, not only does it matter, it matters to men just as much as women, if not more. And I think it's becoming more acceptable maybe because people are more knowledgeable through social media. Uh, not all that knowledge is accurate, but I think people are more aware of what's out there, what can be done, and the effects it can have. And everyone has something that, that they don't like about themselves. And nobody else can tell you it's not real or it's not reasonable. If it bothers you and it's something that safely and easily can be fixed and it changes your quality of life, I think you, you really have to consider it. And one of the things you mentioned media, and I think Again, going back to our early days, the idea of plastic surgery was sort of sensationalized by the Michael Jacksons of the world. And even in New York gr growing up was, uh, I'm sure you remember the story of Jocelyn Wendell Whittlestein, the, the cat lady, because she ended up looking like a cat. Uh, so, and now when you see plastic surgery, it's like, damn, who who they, who, who, who they use for that? So there has been, I don't know if like PR, you know, you, you, your, your industry got a better PR. <laughs> <laughs> representation or things have improved but i feel like nowadays we're not seeing those sort of you know plastic surgery nightmares that were so prevalent in like the early 80s and 90s yeah i i think actually what's probably happening is we're getting a better representation of all of the plastic surgery because people can with a phone post things that they're experiencing which are more normal uh if you go back in time the only things that were out there hitting the media were just sensationalized things that were attention grabbing in the media. You know, 99.9% .9 of our patients don't want to look overdone or like they had something done. Now that's different on the, you know, the West Coast and some New York and Miami and some of these areas. It's, it's a status symbol for some of these folks. So they do go over the top and, and get overdone uh, because probably their perception is a little off uh, compared to the average person. But also it's a status symbol. You know, if you can afford to spend tens of thousands of dollars and people kind of want, certain people anyway, want everyone to know they did that. The biggest concern we hear from folks is I don't want to look overdone. I don't want to look like Kenny Rogers or people like that. And, uh, you know, really it's not the rich that, that really supports our industry overall. There's just honestly not enough rich people <laughs> to do that. It's the, uh, you know, it's the, the hardworking double income families where you know, the wife has had kids and her goal is not to be on the cover of Cosmo. Her goal is to get back to how she was in her twenties or thirties, or at least pre children as close as she can. You know, their, their expectations and goals are to, to fit better in a dress and bathing suit and to, you know, feel more comfortable about themselves. And so I think those are really the ideal patients that we look for and, and the ones that are truly the most sort of satisfied in the end. And you talked about, uh, the sort of cosmetic surgery industries in, in New York and Los Angeles and Miami. You practice in the low country of South Carolina, Charleston, Mount Pleasant area. Is there any difference between like you and a doctor in New York or L is it geography? I mean, are you doing anything differently? Are they doing anything differently than you're doing day to day? No, I would say there's a difference in the patient for sure. You know, when what their expectation and what their goals are for sure. The techniques that are being used, the surgeries that are being done are, are absolutely no different. And we have access to you know, the latest and greatest as well as uh, stuff that has been proven through time. And I think a lot of it, like so much, you know, think, like so many things, uh, is advertising, marketing, and what they're selling is a concept, not really a different procedure. And I think that's, you hear that a lot like with vodka, right? Like vodka, they say there's not much difference in the highest versus the lowest, but it, a lot of it is marketing what the bottle looks like, how, you know, 
uh, like Nike and these these different companies, they sell not a product, they sell an experience or a feeling. And I think that's an important part of plastic surgery. I think how it makes you feel is what's ultimately important. And, uh, you know, there are a lot of folks that come in with a nose and say, I can't live with this. And I look at it and I'm like, I think your nose looks great. Like, but to them, they don't. And so, you know, it's how they, how they feel when they see themselves. And no one is there, you know, is a worse critic than yourself when you're you know, really evaluating yourself. And so I think our job is really to ride that line of what's reasonable, what's achievable, what's safe. There are people that we have to just say, I don't think we can make this better. And then you're going to have a scar and you're not going to be happy. And so I think that's uh, one of the things in residency and surgery residency, even general surgery before plastics, that's a big concept to learn when you're in training is it's easy to know who to operate on. It's really harder and more difficult to know who not to operate on and when not to operate. And one of the things you don't learn when you're in medical school is being an entrepreneur. This is something I've talked about to many doctors who are like, when they're going to medical school, they're busy learning to be doctors. They're not busy learning how to run a practice or or be an entrepreneur. Uh, obviously, you went back and, and got more education. But talk to me about that in terms of plastics, because I feel like of all of the sort of verticals in medicine, I feel like plastics is probably the most entrepreneurial and this is from the surface for me because I don't see a lot of advertisements for a general practitioner or an OBGYN or, but you do see that for cosmetic surgeons. I mean, maybe you can weigh it a little bit in terms of like what it's like to become a doctor without even learning to the business side of things. I mean, obviously, like you said, you went back and did it, but talk to me about that sort of transition from being doctor entrepreneur. Yeah, it's a huge transition. And it's one, I think, it really goes back to the system that we're trained in and educated in, and and those are usually academic centers. And so, an academic center is not a well-run business by any means. Its its purpose is not for profit or to be efficient. It's usually to train, uh, you know, residents, medical students, nurses, and it's it's there to serve a purpose for the general community. A lot of times, folks who who can't afford healthcare, and so it is nothing like running a business. And there are so many levels of bureaucracy and redundancy in a lot of those institutions. And a lot of those doctors are, are really just hired and paid to, for a service. And they're not really incentivized necessarily. And they're, and, you know, they're not really re- rewarded for doing a better job, unfortunately. I think there is a push towards that now, but 20 years ago, that certainly wasn't the case. So you have all these folks coming out who are in training and who spend several years concentrating on on medicine. And uh, if you do go into private practice, and I worked five years in academics and now uh, about 10 years in, in private practice, it's a big difference. Uh, it's a huge difference. There's a lot of uh, advantages and there are a lot of challenges that are different. But I think what what you really have to remember from our approach is that we're selling a service or a commodity, whether you're selling a steak or you're selling a car, uh, sure, surgery is different, and I know I'm not I'm not equating the two. But at the end of the day, a person's coming in paying for something, and we need to deliver. We need to set expectations and make sure we deliver to those expectations, and we need to stand behind what we do. And it's a little different than the mentality of a lot of medical folks. And I think that's one thing: it, it, you're selling a service, and number two, um, it takes advertising, and so that's something that most doctors don't have an experience with. Uh, and most medical fields, like you said, don't go advertising, although you're starting to see some of it with things that are becoming more cash for service. It's hard to advertise if you're 100% accepting insurance because ultimately your patient population is dictated by who's in network and who can come see you. But when you're going out and getting a medical service or aesthetic cosmetic service that you're paying for, you have freedom and choice of who you see. And that's where marketing and uh, reputations and branding, especially branding. I'm a huge, huge fan of branding and believe in it tremendously. And I think that's a big, big part of it. I want to get into your branding part, but one more thing on this. And I don't want to get too deep in the weeds of this, but talking about becoming a doctor slash entrepreneur, getting into the weeds of like running an office, bookkeeping, like how did you learn all of that? Because again, they don't teach that at medical school. Like, how how did you go about doing that and making sure that 
you were running a tight ship and that you were surrounded by people who know what they were doing because I can imagine that can't always be the easiest thing to do as as a physician. Yeah, no, it's not. I think um, you try to surround yourself with the right people and you never know, you know whether or not that's the case ne- necessarily because you don't know better. And I think also if you're fortunate enough to grow, that that environment changes. And so there are some really good business books written about, you know, getting the right people in the right bus, but also in the right seat. <laughs> so uh, a lot of times you can have the right people on the right bus, but if they're not in the right seat, then they're not effective. I, I think you, I think a couple of things, you know, that I, I learned is I think you want to have, you know, some really good legal representation advising you, uh, especially early on when you're building a business so that you, you put in all the requirements that you that you just wouldn't know about unless you had a good healthcare based uh, attorney. I think you need a really good accounting uh, company or service. And I think the biggest thing with doctors, and I think in general, we, we think we can do everything ourselves <laughs> because you know, you're kind of going that route through training. And I think the best thing that a, a young doctor or surgeon can do for themselves is, is realize their sort of limitations and that your time spent much better doing what you've been trained to do. And you have to trust people. You have to outsource bookkeeping, accounting, uh, tax stuff, you know, all of those kind of things to be efficient. And if you want to grow, you have to have that ground level laid in the right way because it's hard to build on a foundation if it's not right. And it's a lot harder to go back and, and, and do that. So I think outsourcing and really getting, you know, the right people in the right place is a very important thing. And, you know, with COVID and the things that have happened, I mean, there's been some struggles with with staffing offices and with getting the right employees. And as you know, the the employment environment has changed a lot uh, over the last couple of years, especially. So getting the right people in, in the right place is very important. Uh, our front desk people are so crucial. They answer the phones. They're the first people to say hello to someone when they walk in. A lot of times, I don't think they realize just how important they are. Because if somebody doesn't get the right feeling at that entry point, we're probably not going to see them or we're not going to have the chance to to make them become a customer or help them become a customer. And uh, I want to bring up a gripe that's been driving me crazy about the the medical industry for the last couple of years is the text automation system that everyone and their mother has signed up for. And the fact that you get 40 text messages and emails confirming your upcoming appointment. Now I get for efficiency's sake, they're great, but man, they are so annoying, Doc. Can can we can can the people in your industry just like back it off a little bit? I have like a, a dentist appointment. I got no joke, like a dozen texts and emails leading up to that appointment. First of all, why do we need so many of those? Is it just because it's the default setting that you folks like sign up for? Or what's the deal with that? Yeah, it's funny. I, I we were just talking about that today and, and trying to devise the best sort of CRM protocol in terms of customer relation management. You know, when do you call people? When do you follow up with them? And how, how you do that in a way that is keeps you at top of mind and, and hopefully addressing any problems that they have without without annoying them. Um, I think a lot of it is the programs that are built today are not necessarily the most efficient. Despite all those messages, we still have people who show up and say, I didn't know, or they'll say, I went, you know, they went to the wrong office. So I, I don't know what the right answer is for that. You know, it's kind of like the social media world. You know, you hear post two to three times a day or a week, and now people are saying you can't post enough. I mean, so I don't know what that is. It, it's hard. I think we're trying to balance that with, you know, a touch point or two. And then, you know, at some point you got to leave them to their own devices and, and try not to upset them. So it's a hard one because, you know, we'll see... I don't know, anywhere between 500 and maybe 700 patients in a week in our multiple offices. And with that, you have a wide variance of the people. And so there are people who don't mind it, people who want that, and people who absolutely hate it. <laughs> and so unfortunately, it, it's just so hard to know where that right right point is. I, I mean, I, I totally understand the the idea behind it. And I think it's obviously, especially since we are all like surgically attached to our phones, it makes perfect sense. But I feel like there needs to be a little more nuance to it. Um, here's an example. So I had an appointment to go to a, uh, oral surgeon and they had sent me multiple texts and emails reminding me about the appointment. The morning of the appointment, I get an email from the human who works at the office. They're like, Hey, just want to remind you about the appointment. And also don't forget to bring in a CD of your CT scan. I'm like, what? Well, I didn't know anything about that. And, but, but I did get 40 messages reminding me of the appointment. So I feel like 
using all of that like automation is wonderful, but I still think that you it can't be like the Ron Popeil set it and forget it. Like use it, but make sure, like you said, have that CRM, have have a methodology in place where it's not just doing it for the sake of doing it. Yeah, and I think like you alluded to, I mean, it, it's a, there becomes it, you know, generational changes, and um, you know, I still. I would much rather our people call someone and speak to someone, but there are a lot of people who are bothered by that. And as today, especially who aren't used to that or don't want that, you know, I, I read over the weekend, I don't know where I saw it, that something about, you know, you send a text message, but you don't leave a voicemail anymore. Like, I guess, again, depending on who you're, who's, who the target is, it's different and it's hard, you know, and I, but I do think that's, it's something that I'm very interested in. I wish we could, I wish we could figure out the right mix of that, of how to do that. But I, I would rather you know, talk with somebody because I think there are a lot of things that come up that aren't being covered. And the other thing with multiple touch points, or if you do that, you know, a huge amount, it also increases the likelihood of, of like an error <laughs> because, you know, then people, we, you know, they get the wrong message, the wrong time, the wrong date, the wrong place. And so um, at some point it's just, you kind of, you know, you got to set it up, let it go and see what happens. All right. Well, we're not going to fix that problem today, Doc. No, but uh, I wish we could. And so earlier you mentioned about branding, and one of the reasons, and one of the ways you're building your brand is you wrote a book called "Finding the New You." Um, so let's start with the book. Why a book? Of all the things you could have done, because we all see many ways that, especially cosmetic surgeons, reach out to folks, whether it's with social media, TV ads, direct to consumer. But w why was a book important for you, Doc? Uh, you know, I ca I kind of came about it. I, I didn't set out to write a book. I had kind of been watching some YouTube stuff and um, some podcasts and uh, those TED Talks. And I had seen one by a gentleman who was a design engineer and talked about, uh, this is actually in the introduction to the book. You know, he talked about beauty and what is beauty. And it kind of made me start thinking like, it really is difficult to tell somebody else or to understand what somebody else thinks is beauty. And so in our field, it's really interesting and challenging for us to do that. So what I may think looks perfect on somebody, they may not. And what they think is perfect, I'm like, God, we need to fix that. So it's it's really an interesting thing. You know, I, I've always liked books. I was kind of as growing as a kid growing up. And even today, I love sitting in bookstores and actually physically holding something, whether it's a magazine or a book and looking at it. And I, I still can't get used to reading books on iPads and things like that. I just, it's just not, it, there's something about the experience I also like the idea, and I didn't, I can't say I knew this at the time, but we've used the book as a tool with pre ops. So when people come in to sign up for surgery, we've started giving them some of these books to take home and to read. And I think that's a huge thing for them to look at and to kind of build their expectations and also helps them get some of their questions answered, but also generate some questions for us. So it's kind of a tool that we let people take home with them. And so I think that's been extremely helpful. Uh, you know, today I know people do a lot more high tech things than than write books, but we did do a audio version of it, and uh, so I think that's definitely like like this podcast and audio has become you know obviously much bigger. So, but I just I kind of have the old you know thought where I, I enjoyed books. I always liked them. I still like stopping at bookstores. So the book is not a how to plastic surgery book. So it's not like where no. you're you're teaching people. Uh, what what is the book like? How would you describe because I, uh, you know, flipping through it, I was like, it's, in it's like interesting concepts about what is beauty, about appearance, impact on it. So it's not the book you would immediately expect from 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 a, a cosmetic surgeon. So why did you go this route in terms of like what you were trying to like parse out? What, what, what kind of information were you hoping that people, you know, like a young Dr. Dennis Shimp walking through a bookstore coming across it? What, what were you what were you hoping people get out of it? So I, I can start by saying what I didn't want to do. And that's, I didn't want to make it be, you know, a walking billboard or advertisement for me or for our practice. So I wanted to do something that was useful across a, a bigger sort of population. So I really wanted the book to help somebody who was considering plastic surgery with us or with, with anyone, anywhere else. And I wanted it to be a tool that they could use ahead of time and maybe use as they went through the process. So what we did was basically took concepts that we see on a regular basis from patients, whether it's, you know, post or pre-op questions or, you know, kind of getting their family on board, uh, talking about the healing process after surgery, 
the long-term process about things. So things that we saw on a regular basis, and I used a patient or two to write each chapter. So each chapter addressed one of these concepts that I thought was repetitive and important enough that somebody would benefit who was considering plastic surgery, who had had plastic surgery, whose family was having, pro- you know, those types of things, that they would get something out of it, that it was an easy book to read, it was quick, and it hit some of the major concepts that that come up in that process. And again, I wanted it to be for anyone, and I hope that's the, the case. You know, I hope somebody in Nebraska who's considering it reads it and gets something out of it. That's cool. And in the book, you also bust some myths. What are some of the myths of plastic surgery that t- top mind, maybe like, you know, how like the text messages from doctors annoy me? Like, what's one myth that annoys you the most about uh, plastic surgery? Well, I think the biggest thing that we deal with is, you know, we see somebody ahead of surgery, we talk about a plan, we go through a tremendous amount of information and, you know, they'll show up at the first visit days later and complain about the outcome at that point, you know, and and we literally will tell people this is a four month, eight month, a year, scars take a year to a year and a half to get better. I don't know how to get that message through to people any better. And then I'll say, like, we talked about this and they'll be like, oh yeah, you know, I, I guess I remember, or they'll tell me they didn't remember, which even amazes me more because they've read it, they've signed things, they've, I've told them. But, you know, I think um, I think it gets back to the human concept and, and probably, you know, evolutionary folks say it's the only way humans get out of bed is that you sort of don't think it's going to happen to you. So the other thing is complications, right? Like every surgery known to mankind, every medical procedure, there is no zero complication rate and there's no 100% success rate. So I tell folks that all the time. There are no zeros or 100%. And um, and a complication is no reflection on the person. It's basically, or the surgeon or the patient, it's just a number of at-bats that there is an end number that something will happen if you do it enough times. And again, I think we as individuals just don't ever think any of that's going to happen to us. So when it does, we're always surprised. And when it does happen to you, it's no longer, you know, a 1% complication rate. It's 100% for you now because you've had it. And so I think that's, you know, we try to educate folks. And I think that's where the book hopefully can help people ahead of time. And we also try to encourage folks, you know, to, to have patience. And we tell them that ahead of time, because once they're having a problem, they don't believe you. You know, they think you're just telling them that to kind of, you know, shut them up and kind of move on. But if you tell them ahead of time, listen, like, you know, there is a number of people that will have a wound healing issue that will have an infection that will need to have a revision. Uh, and that number is real and it's, it's, it can be significant, you know, that the, the human body is dynamically different from each individual. And so that's why large studies are done to understand what the most likely outcome or common outcome will be. But, you know, it, it's a bell curve and there are people at both sides of it that, you know, don't have an issue. And then there are people that have more issues than, than average. And there's just not a test that we can do ahead of time to know who that is, unfortunately. Which, uh, which, uh, surgery takes the most time to recover from. Uh, if you were to like anecdotally, obviously, don't, without getting the data points, but like, which do you see that is like the one that takes the the longest for folks to get back to sort of their quote unquote normal self? Well, definitely the more invasive stuff we do. So if you do liposuction, it's very you know limited and not invasive. It's done through tiny couple millimeter holes. Uh, you know you're sore, but you can go back to normal activity the next day. Wow. Uh, when we get into you know tummy tuck abdominal plasties where we're tightening muscle. Uh, folks are sore. It hurts. You know, for five to seven days, it really hurts. But um, you know, by two to three weeks, they're up and about, and a lot of non-physical jobs you can get back to. Uh, what we're talking about in the in the several months is really swelling, residual swelling, and final outcome. So skin tightening, skin kind of adjustment um, that takes months and months. And scarring, it can take a year, a year and a half, two years in certain skin. You know, folks that have lighter especially folks who have light skin, light colored eyes, their skin tends to get really red and they can have scars for, you know, a long time. And it's, it's hard because the scars usually look really good initially at three months, they look bad. They get worse up to about nine months and then, you know, they start to get better. And there's things that we do to try to help that. But the, you know, the American way is not patient, you know, to have patience for anything. So even though they hear us ahead of time and I say the same thing and that's what folks will say, you didn't tell me that. I'm like, no, I told you that because I tell every single person the same thing. Uh, they forget. And again, they don't think it's going to happen. I could tell you, you know, listen, you're going to have a bad scar and it's going to take a year and a half and you know, 
fifty percent of the people have that, they, they don't see themselves as being that that chance of them being that fifty percent. You know, and I, it's kind of anecdotally too. I remember when I used to do trauma surgery. Uh, you know, we have people come in like with ruptured aneurysms and stuff, and you literally tell these families and the patients it was sad that we'll try to operate, but your survival rate is fifty percent. Or, you know, in some of these bad cases that are dissecting and ruptured and, you know, they would look at you and say, well, so I'm going to be okay. And I'm like, yeah, I mean, I'm whole, yes, it's hopefully, but th that 50% is not a great, great odds, you know, in your favor, but we just don't see it when it's us that something's going to happen. The other thing that we deal with that's interesting, and, and I always, this is a, when you mentioned frustration you know, they'll come in and tell me like what their sister said or what their aunt said or somebody that had one, you know, they know somebody. They'll or say, what well, the I internet have a, said. Right. Well, the internet's a yeah. whole other story, but, you know, <laughs> but they'll come in and say, you know, my aunt said this wasn't right and she had surgery and she didn't have this. And I'm like, well, so your, your sample size is an N of one, which I'm sure it's not the exact same thing that we're talking about. She's right. not the exact same person. It's frustrating. Uh, we try to prevent that. I think patient preparation and sort of hopefully books and things like podcasts, you know, listening to the right sources will give you a more realistic expectation. You know, if you're going to somebody and they're telling you you're going to be great, you're going to get the best result, don't have anything to worry about, 100% going to be perfect. That's not good and, and not likely. All right. Let's, and let's end on a, on a bright note. So, you know, of the hundreds of people you see each week, you do some amazing surgery. You change people's lives literally. Um, do you recognize that? Are you aware or are you just so busy of just like, here's another one, here's another one, here's a, or, or do you, stop, do, are you able to step back after like a, an amazing procedure? Like, eh, I did a good job there. I mean, are you, are you that self-aware or are you just so busy in what you do that you don't realize the impact you have on these folks? Well, I don't, I don't think it's because we're so busy. I, I think that you know, you can have 99 great outcomes and it's the one upset bad outcome that bothers you. And I think the things yeah. that, you know, really weigh on on me and I know a lot of my colleagues is the things that you lay in bed at night and worry about or think about are those things where people are not happy. And, um, and you know, they they at times will kind of make it a personal thing, like, you know, somehow we, we didn't deliver what they wanted. And, um, you know, that can be a factor of how they heal, genetics, it can be a factor that has to do with expectations and maybe we didn't set those expectations properly. Or sometimes it can just be people don't understand. And when something doesn't go right, they want to blame somebody. So, you know, I, I wish I wish we took as much joy in the good outcomes as we do, you know, the bad outcomes. Uh, unfortunately, that's usually not the case because it's the, it's the things that weigh on you and, and you try to figure out ways to make it better or to make people happy. Um, and, you know, you hear criticisms about things and, and none of us are doing anything to anyone on purpose. And, you know, they'll say, oh, you know, plastic surgeons, they only care about money. They only care about this and businesses and stuff. Well, it's kind of counterintuitive. If that's the case, especially, then we only want people to be happy. <laughs> you know, the idea that, you know, somebody being unhappy is, is some way, you know, what we wanted is, is kind of, you know, not, not true at all. So those are the things that you worry about. I think with time and, and hopefully you know, experience and maturity, you learn that there, unfortunately you can't change that uh, with everyone. And you try to look at the other, you know, for every person that's unhappy, the dozens and dozens of people that are extremely, but it's like anything, you know, you don't, you don't hear from the people who necessarily are always ecstatic and happy. And so we do appreciate when folks will say that, or when you hear secondhand and you're like, you know, I didn't know if that person was really happy, but to hear that is, is really, um, you know, important. And I think, you know, for young doctors and surgeons, I think, you know, I had an athletic director in college who always said, you know, never too high, never too low. You're, you're sort of as good as your last outing when I, when I played college sports. And, you know, I think that's, but it's a hard thing for people that are, that are, you know, trying to do the best they can. It's, you almost feel, you know, weak and saying, oh, I'm happy because they're happy. I, I'm more worried about the people that are unhappy. Do you uh, still impress yourself with some of your work to be like, Man, Dennis, I did a good job on that one because you do so many of them. So I guess you yeah. know, a lot of times they're all very similar. But have you had cases even recently like, man, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty good at this. Do you, do you ever catch yeah. yourself doing that? Well, I think I think you evolve over time. I mean, there are definitely things that I do today that I feel have much better outcomes than they did five years ago or 10 years ago. I think there is definitely a curve uh, with anything 
that, you know, you do get better. And, and the only way you know how to get better is kind of evaluating and seeing the outcome. So the thing with surgery is you can you can do a, a good surgery and it looks good at the moment, but what it looks like three months, a year, year and a half later is really the final judgment of it. And, and you can't get that without time. And um, I think that's, you know, you do learn over time, you learn not what, or you learn what not to do as well. Um, there are a lot of things that, you know, I did because someone else told me or I watched somebody else do it. And now reflecting back on that, I, I wouldn't do that today. So I think, you know, it's a fine line with anything. Experience is really important. And at some point, you know, you get better at stuff just by number of at-bats, right? Like you do it and, and you see better outcomes because of it. But um, I think, again, you know, you just... It's funny, but each time you just want somebody to be happy and you want the outcome to be good. And so uh, when that happens, it's not that you're ecstatic, it's almost relief. <laughs> so I think <laughs> that's probably what keeps people you know, motivated in, in doing it. And that's what I, I enjoy doing it. Uh, I, I come to work to do procedures to try to make people happy and I enjoy doing them. And uh, I do think with time they've gotten better. And hopefully, you know, with technology and continued experience, they only get better and better with time. Awesome. His name is Dr. Dennis Ship. He is the author of Finding the New You. Doc, thanks so much for the time. I really appreciate it. Joe, thank you. It was great talking with you. And that'll do it for another episode of the Forbes Books Podcast. Don't forget to hit subscribe. That way you'll get new episodes as soon as they're available. And if you have a spare moment, I would greatly appreciate it if you could leave a review, which would help other exceptional entrepreneurs like you discover the show. You can always connect with me on X, LinkedIn, and Instagram at Joe Partavilla or TikTok at Jay Partavilla. And please don't forget the golden rule and treat others as you want to be treated. Thanks for listening. Until next time, adios.